Hello, and welcome to episode 113 of Pros. This week, say goodbye to your most beloved a second time. Please do go follow the show on social media under at Pros Podcast across platforms. If you are enjoying the show, please click that five-star review button wherever you are listening. For easiest access to the show, subscribe using whatever podcast app is your favorite. And lastly, check out the Pros Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash pros podcast and consider supporting the show there. You will receive both heaps of gratitude and a little bit of swag with that deal. We do only have one story this week as it is a little longer than normal. So, thanks for listening. Let's get to the tale, shall we? This week we have Losing You Again. Enjoy. short story by Jared I. McGee. The flight to Manila flew by. Though his sleep was fitful and full of horrendous, if a bit nonsensical, nightmares, Jeremiah knew that whatever he was walking into wasn't something he could begin to fully grasp. To get tied in knots before he even knocked on the door to room 1029 was useless. This was most likely going to be unpleasant, but he couldn't prognosticate precisely what was coming. He had no powers of foretelling like his namesake, so why not go in with an open mind and open heart? He knew when Kimberly had emailed him out of the blue that something was odd. She'd not spoken to him in three years after their five-year relationship had ended in the wake of a lot of indifference and neglect on his part and infidelity and lies on hers. This room, this 1029, is the room where they'd stayed the first and only time he'd been to the capital of the Philippines. They'd come for work, both of them having to flit around the city separately but they met up at every free moment to explore and experience this new place together. Kim had dreamt of visiting Manila since she was a little girl. She'd been enamored by the Filipino history she'd learned from her grandfather who had been in the service during World War II. Her eyes were wide and gleaming and her head never stopped swiveling when they stole their moments away as they came. Because this place was Kim's fantasy land, Jeremiah had planned to propose to her that last day in Manila. The night before, he treated her to the most amazing Korean food they'd ever had, and they ate a lot of Korean back in Boston. That indulgence changed their lives. Jeremiah got food poisoning from his bibimbap and was violently ill for the next 48 hours, causing them to miss their flight and upending his plans of the perfect proposal there in the most special of places. A hospital visit, some fluids through IV, and a miserable plane ride later, they were back in their rather predictable lives in Boston. Jeremiah kept an eye out for another occasion that he could amend with a proposal. But nothing special enough for his Kimberly came. Unfortunately, Kim read the hesitance as lack of interest. She became distant. That shook Jeremiah's confidence, so so he became distant in turn. Through the twists and turns of life, they became strangers living in the same home, and Kim turned to a mouth-breathing cliché of a man for solace and understanding. He didn't have the brains or prospects or potential of Jeremiah, but Kim was looking more for abs, height, and an aesthetic that would make her friends think her Instagram feed was popping. 
so ended a half decade for the two. Had they turned right and not left, missing the opportunity to indulge their love of Korean cuisine entirely that evening almost four years ago, their lives would have been very different. Since then, Kim had bopped from job to job, city to city. She was desperate for an exotic, Instagrammable life, and, to her credit, she accomplished that, even if she had become someone unrecognizable to do so. She always returned to Boston and the mouth breather, though. She was always a nester, even more so than Jeremiah, and he found that ironic. Jeremiah had taken a job four hours south in New York City. He was a bit slow for Manhattan, so he lived out in Astoria, choosing to commute to the island every day. It was a trek, but he enjoyed audiobooks enough that he'd come to enjoy the train. When he jostled and bumped his way down the subway track every morning and evening, he thought of her. She had thought he'd never leave Boston. Again, he too was an Esther. He wanted a home. He hungered for one. Yet here he was in this big apple becoming part of that hustle and bustle centered culture and quickly becoming what his old friends called cityfied. As he reached to knock, the gold plated 1029 gleaming, the tumult of remembrances almost stayed his hand. But he had come all that way. He couldn't just not show up. Curiosity was overwhelming his growing anxiety, and he consciously stamped down the swelling wariness, angry that he'd failed at the the live-in-the-moment style push forward he'd sworn to himself he'd embrace after Kim had left all that time again, and then re-sworn himself to the moment before arriving at the hotel room door. He knocked. He heard some shuffling. From behind the door came, Jeremiah, is that you? Y- y- yes, Kim, it, <clears throat> it's me. His voice broke. Shit. Just hearing her say his name was enough to have his emotions rise and threaten to take him over. His voice cracked. His head twirled to dizziness. The door opened inwardly, hesitantly at first, then upon seeing him and their matching brown eyes meeting, all the way. She smiled. He smiled. Hers seemed genuine. He knew his was confused and forced. It was probably screaming of fear and reluctance. Good God. He was aware that Kim had had power over him, but he had forgotten just how much he loved this woman. Looked like he still did love this woman. Shit. 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 Come on in, shy boy. It's good to see you. Kim closed the door behind him as he entered. Then she turned and gave him a curt, chaste hug. As alien as such an emotionless embrace from her was, his stomach still lurched. This had been a terrible idea. He adored her. One does not simply turn off wanting to spend the rest of your life with someone, wanting to have and raise children together. Jeremiah realized his hands had already begun to tremble. He put them in his pockets and looked around, whistling. Boy, oh boy, this place is even fancier than I remember it. How on earth did we afford this? I knew somebody that knew somebody, remember? (laughs) You always knew somebody that knew somebody. It sure is nice, though. Jeremiah sat down in one of the overstuffed chairs. 
Kim walked over to where a bottle of wine was already uncorked, and two glasses of red were already poured. She grabbed both and came nearer to Jeremiah, offering him one. Two reunions, she said, clinking her glass to his. Two reunions, he answered, barely swallowing the lump in his throat. They each sipped their red wine. It wasn't the cheap stuff. Jeremiah didn't know much about wine, but he knew when one tasted expensive. This was very expensive. Kim had never been one to know the value of money. Her parents had started out humbly enough, but she was a rich girl through and through. Still, she wasn't one to splurge, so this was odd. Jeremiah thought better of commenting on the price of the wine. Jeremiah thought better of telling her he'd missed her. Hell, Jeremiah didn't know what to say without his gut or his voice or his tear ducts betraying him, so he sat mute, slurping on his red wine and wishing, as he always did with red wine, that he could be low class and plop an ice cube or two into the room temperature velveteen drink. The silence endured for almost a full five minutes. They'd both gone through a little over half their glass of wine. It was excruciating. The silence, of course, not this beautiful beverage. Then, Let me top you off, Jay. It was a statement, not a question. She walked to the little table slash bureau set down her glass, snatched up the wine, came over and poured him some, went back to the table and topped off her own glass. With her back still to him, she said, Jeremiah, I'm not here to apologize, but I do want you to know that I know I hurt you. You eviscerated me, Kim. I wasn't joking that last time we spoke so long ago. I'm done. Might as well be walking dead. Please don't interrupt, Jay. Kim turned around and her eyes blazed. She took another mouthful of wine, seeming to steel herself against what she was going to say. I'm dying, Jeremiah. There was nothing that could have prepared him for that. He knew an anvil would fall on him at some point tonight, but this almost took him out of his chair. What? How? What, what is it? How long do you have? I would say that I am down to about an hour, maybe less. What? Well, how on earth could you possibly know that, Kim? What, what do you have? I mean, Jeremiah, please. You could never listen well. I took a little something, some cyanide, had it with my first glass of red before you came in. I'm ready to be done. Jeremiah lurched out of his chair, digging in his pocket for his cell phone, but that wouldn't work here. He knew that. He'd not okayed the extra charge for international roaming or a plan. His frugality would kill her. He made for the telephone there in the hotel room, but Kimberly blocked his way and stopped his gallant charge with one tender touch to his arm. Jay, I'm done. It's too late. The tears began to stream from him. No one calls me Jay anymore, he said, choked with the sobs that were trying to make their way out. I always did, and I always shall, my love. With that, he broke. Sobs. Wails. He now knew what the Bible meant when his Sunday school lessons talked of wailing and gnashing of teeth and rending of clothes. She pet him silent after those first violent moments of emotion. I wanted to spend my last moments with you, Jeremiah. I know you don't think I deserve it, but I wanted that peace. 
A lot has happened in the past three years, and I simply can't face it. Please don't judge me harshly, but please don't think you can talk me out of it either. It's too late anyway. I just... I need to be at peace. Jeremiah sighed heavily, breathing in and out several times trying to calm his raging and ragged breathing enough so he could speak. Surprisingly, his breathing exercises worked rather well. <laughs> I can't lose you again, he managed to scratch out. Shh, 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 shh. Kim hushed him like she might a child. No like she used to when their dog Marigold would get scared during thunderstorms. And she pet Jeremiah's arm. She led him to the bed and pulled him to sit next to her on her right. She wove her arms around his left arm and put her head on his left shoulder, snuggling into him like she used to any time they were sat next to one another. That elicited another sob from Jeremiah despite his best efforts to swallow it down. She clung to him then, and they sat in silence on that bed in that room where they had once loved one another in such a way that the world envied them. He wept, but tried to keep his gasping, clawing, violent cries pushed down to his gut. He reached his right hand around and pet her in a half embrace as she continued to hold his left arm tightly. I would have loved you forever. You know that, right? He hoarsely whispered after quite a long time. I know. She answered just on the other side of a whisper herself. I will love you forever, you know. He asked. I know. You were my one. Even if I screwed it up, I... Shh, 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 shh. She comforted again. Let's not end it like that. She took her head off his shoulder and then pulled his face to hers. Kim kissed him then. A sweet kiss of lips to lips, far from the chaste hug from earlier that night, but not sexual. A kiss of knowing, and sweetness, and love, and apology, and anger, and misunderstanding, and regret, and hatred, and missteps, and children that would never be, and laughter, and so very much more. In that moment, at least, she loved him back. She loved him in the way she once had loved and in the way that he had never stopped loving her, no matter how much venom he tried to inject into his memories and thoughts of her. When she pulled back, her eyes shone. Then, as if a switch were flipped that light dimmed a bit, they rolled back, and her body began to convulse. Jeremiah screamed, No! and leapt up. He knew damn well he couldn't save her alone. He knew CPR, but that wasn't going to help. He pressed the emergency button on the phone. He told the emergency workers what was going on, and they swore they'd be there in moments. But Kim was already shaking. He knew that they would not make it in time. So, as he waited for strangers to come in and take her from him, Jeremiah did what Kim had asked of him. He held her as she shook, and her body allowed the life to leak from her. He kept her from hitting her head, as if that would somehow make things better for her. He smoothed her hair. 
he made the same shushing noises she'd used to comfort him. He held her and told her he loved her over and over and over and over again still. He sweetly kissed her lips one last time in some misguided Romeo and Juliet-esque attempt to join her. But he would not. By the time the paramedics rushed in and took her from him, she was gone. They still had to make an effort, but Jeremiah felt her leave. He wept and crooned out, keening wails. He had lost her again, the love of his life. Thank you for listening to Losing You Again, an original short story by me, Jared I. McGee. All sounds and music that you've heard behind this story come from YouTube's free audio library, freesound.org, and or are my own creation. For those sounds that are not mine, they are being used under CC0 1.0 public domain dedication licenses. That does it this week for prose. We are having this one longer extended story this week. But we will be back in two weeks' time, so please subscribe so you can join in next time. As you go about your week, please love those around you, tell them that you do, and embrace this life as it is, always, stranger than fiction. Thanks for listening. See you next time.